don't know. I can have a1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 17. I think this is our 21st message in the series. We're making our way through this wonderful 1 Corinthians. Verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? 
Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry, one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. This section of 1 Corinthians deals with another of the problems at the Corinthian church. We have a bunch of people who are saved out of a very ungodly uh, culture, an ungodly city, an ungodly society. That church has only been in existence for seven years. There are no believers or very, very few believers in that assembly who are well established, spiritually, scripturally, Speaking, it's an immature church. Terribly immature. So, Paul, he has to address the problem. The problems are many. The questions are many. And he comes up, he's given us God-inspired answers to the problems in that local church. And so, let's look at the explanations, the answers that Paul gives here. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. Uh, particularly, the division is caused around something called the love feast. It's a pot, as it were in our relation, a potluck meal that took place before the Lord's Supper. And they would enjoy this meal but there were problems with it. Uh, it's mentioned in Jude 12. There are spots in your feasts of charity. And so there are problems with this meal. And the way it happens. And what's going on. And the attitudes among the people. So let's look at it. Okay? Yep. First there's the division. The problem of division. In verse 17 and 18... You'll find there that there's division. He said, I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions. Five times in eight verses, you'll find the, this statement. Ye come together. Ye come together. You come together. You come together and then this in the church. 
it says. Well, I'd begin by saying that the Lord instituted the church. He instituted it and he gave directions to us about how we're to attend and how we are to observe the Lord's Supper and many other things. But it's certain that he says that we are to come together in the church. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. He said that we are to assemble together. And it's his directive. 1 Timothy 3, 15, That thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. God's house is God's design for God's people to hear God's word on God's day in particular and to grow in the ways of God. Now, let me say, the Corinthian believers are, obey, are obeying God in one regard in that they physically came together but they are disobeying in that they were relationally torn apart. There was division. They're coming together, but there's division. And Paul says, I cannot compliment you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. He said, when you come to the house of God, the time you leave, you're worse off than you were before you came. That can happen. <laughs> and he rebukes them for it. Why are they worse off? Verse 18 said, There be divisions among you. Schisma is the word. It means to split or to tear. It's the same word, S C H, for, uh, or S C H I S M A. But it, it's a word from which we get the word scissors. So things are being cut apart. Separation is occurring. Division is among them. And then we're told why there's division. Well, why would there be a dividing among believers? Well, we're told, verse 19, there are heresies among you. There's bad thinking in the assembly. There are improper views in the assembly which caused the split in the congregation. Now, I would say that uh, it, that kind of improper thinking could be doctrinal. That'll split a church. And then having said that, it may not be doctrinal it may just simply be practical. It may be that there is something going on, stuff going on like is going on here in this chapter. Not really a doctrinal issue so much. It is just an attitudinal issue among the people. What's going on? Well, we're told in verse 20 through 22 and then verse 33 and 34... We're told that at that fellowship meal before the Lord's Supper, the well-to-do come early and they bring their lavish meal for themselves. They made sure to come early, those verses tell us, so they didn't have to share with the latecomers. They came early so they got the best of the stuff for themselves. <laughs> they are a selfish people, not a sacrificial people. They are an inconsiderate people here. They're not considerate of others and their needs. They didn't wait for others to get there fact of the matter, it implies that they came particularly early. So they didn't have to wait 
for others who were coming. And so we're told that the latecomers didn't have much. Said some are hungry, verse 21. They don't have anything to eat. They don't have much. And others are drunken. They're gluttonously full. The early comers. It's the first comers and the late comers. The first comers gorge themselves. And then the late comers come. And it appears as though they are more poverty stricken. And when they come, they have already, there's very little for them. I can see how there could be a division in the church. Somehow, there's a, almost like a caste system. The elitist, they get, they look down on those who don't have as much. We, we've already determined that there's cliques in the assembly. Oh, I'm a Peter and I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Jesus. And, and the, there are all these factions and this division has bled right over into this love feast right into the Lord's Supper time. They're divided. Verse 22, Paul says, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? And despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. What you're doing, he said to the elitist, he said, the first comers, he said, you're, you are absolutely looking down on those and shaming others. The poor are excluded, they're hungry, they do without. What a terrible thing degrading others based on economic status. See? The haves and the have-nots. Those that have not. The poor. And it says they despise. Despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not. You're despising the church. You're, you're disesteeming, low value is the idea. You are thinking lightly of God's church to the point that you would act like that at the house of God. And Paul rebukes them for it. Verse 17, verse number 22. He said this, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. At verse 22, he said, what are you doing? The latter part of the verse, what shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You don't need, you don't deserve any compliment acting like that. The problem of division. Secondly, the positive of division. Look at verse number 19. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be manifest among you. Why, why is there heresies? Why is there factions and division and this kind of uh, different thinking that's causing problems like this. He says that they which are approved may be manifest. You know that God uses division to show who is approved in the church. Dakimas, approved. It's the word dakimas. A word that describes the purifying of precious metals, gold and silver. It was, it was put through the test, separating the impurities. 
and so that the silver and gold would be made better so that the silver and gold would be approved it's not just all mixed up with all kinds of rocks and all kinds of no 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 it's it's purified and made into what it's supposed to be the idea here is in division God will make it obvious to the flock who are true spiritual leaders and who are real servants of God and who are carnal selfish people you say you say would there be that in a church well yeah Jesus said there's weed, there, there's tares among the wheat right yeah <laughs> there always have been the, the devil see to it he tries to tear stuff up So, evil helps manifest good. Divisions help us to see good and evil. Help us to see doctrinal good and evil, teachings that are good and evil, and practices that are good and evil. It does. It always flushes out. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right, point number three. The problem of division, the positive of division. Thirdly, the prevention of desecration. How do we prevent desecration before God? We can get desecrated before God. We can get dirty before God. We can get out of fellowship with God. Certainly so. This assembly has many a person who is desecrated. It's evident as we've gone through we're already through 11 chapters and man one issue after another issue and you go that's going on at church that's going on at church and that's going on at church you've got to be kidding me are these folks Christian well some of them are I'm sure he and he says so in the sixth chapter but they're also saved people getting caught up in it all and they're doing this kind of stuff and desecrating themselves before God. So how do we prevent desecration? Two things. By first, trusting God's revelation. In verse number 23 through 26, we have the typical Lord's Supper record. That first Lord's Supper record. And we use it all the time. So, uh, uh, we may revisit the, those verses. Okay? We use them all the time. But what's going on for sure is in verse number 23, Paul received revelation from the Lord and proclaims that which God told him to the church at Corinth. And that revelation is about the Lord's Supper. It's a sacred ordinance, the sacred ordinance given by God to the church. This meal uh, causes us to remember how that Jesus died for our sins, the broken body, the shed blood. We're to re recall Calvary and the Christ of Calvary. And how that now we are forgiven sinners we are accepted in the beloved. We are in the family of God. We are going to heaven. We have been delivered from the wrath of God. All of that supper reveals to us those great substitutionary works that the Son of God did for us so we could be have all of this and so we could be in the family. So, our cleansing comes by trusting God's revelation to us, God's promises to us about what Jesus has done for us and about what Jesus will do for us. How do we prevent desecration? 
by focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did. Then, verse 27 and 28, the prevention of desecration by a testing self-examination. Not only a trusting God's revelation, but a testing self-examination. Verse 28 says, Let a man, woman, boy or girl, examine himself. That's a present imperative, which means continued repeated action, a command to do something that is continuous and repeated. I'm to be examining myself over and over and over. Before I observe the Lord's Supper, I'm to test myself. I'm to look myself over. I am to examine my relationship with the Lord Jesus. Right? How, how do I prevent desecration before God? I constantly examine myself. That's one of the things that I know. Before I was saved, I didn't so much concerned about all that kind of stuff. But after I got saved, that's one of the things that's been... Uh, 40 plus years in my life, I'm constantly looking at myself. Where am I at? Where's my heart? What do I love? What's the priority of life? Do I love the Son of God? Do I pray? Do I read the Word of God? Do I worship? Do I read the Word of God and pray because I want to? Not just because I have to. A lot of self-examination. What about my attitude? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting to church early because I am getting the good stuff. And if I'm hoping Aaron doesn't get there because if he gets there, he's going to eat the whole thing and I'll have nothing. And I'm not putting up with it. Hey, Amen. <laughs> You, you can tell he's a real eater. <laughs> uh, test your relationship with the Lord. Test yourself. Test your relationship with others. What they needed to do was look it over and see the approach that they've had, that they're having toward each other in the assembly. Terrible. Terrible. So the prevention of desecration. That ought to be about us. Am I confessed up? You'll have to confess up. You'll have to talk to the Lord about your sins and failures. And then finally, number four. The punishment of defiance or desecration. Verse number 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Now let me hasten to say, there are people that won't take the Lord's Supper simply because they feel unworthy. Well, let me tell you, we are all unworthy. But what's going on here is they're partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. That's the problem. They are coming, they're having a big meal, and there's all this partiality that's going on, and it says that some are even getting drunk, which might mean that they're just gorging themselves, but it could also in Corinthian culture mean somebody's boozing it up before they get to the Lord's Supper. And the Lord said, this stuff's gone on long enough. I'm going to start dealing with it. I've shown mercy and grace and long suffering, but now some things are happening. Look at it. 
It said, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You say, what's all that mean? I don't know exactly what all that means. I do know what the word guilty means. The word guilty means you're charged with a crime and it means you're going to be held liable and you're subject to punishment. I know that much. And then on through... Verse 29 and following, he said, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. And that's not eternal damnation, but punishment. Punishment to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, and I note that next word, many, not just a few, at this Corinthian church. But they're in such a mess that many are weak. And there's these three categories. There are categories of chast chastisement given here. There are different degrees of discipline that God extends to them. Some are weak. That's an absence of the power of God in them. And then it seems like this is the next stage. Sickly. God has let some of them get sick. Now, we know. We're, we're going to look at that. We're coming to the 12th through 14th chapter. We're going to deal with all the gifts, spiritual gift stuff, gift of healing and all that. L let me hasten to say right here that not every sickness is because of sin. It's not. But here it is. God will use, can use, does use sickness as one of his disciplines toward his children. Who are being stubborn and defiant and rebellious need to get straightened out about things. Many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep. That's biblical term for to describe New Testament term. Certainly to describe a child of God who has died. You say, would the Lord do that? Ask Ananias and Sapphira. The Lord says, uh, he says back there in the Psalm 55 or whatever it is back in there, he says, they'll not live out half their days. You know what that means? Got cut short. Their days got cut short. It's possible. You, you know what this teaches me? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It, it means that God is serious about church business. It's dangerous to fool with it. It's dangerous for a child of God to play games at the house of God. You say, oh, you guys are all laughing. All that. I'm not talking about that. We're fellowshipping and rejoicing, having fun in God. And it's good, clean stuff, isn't it? Having said that, we've come to the Word of God, and the Word of God now says, be careful about sin. It'll get you in trouble. with the Lord it will hinder what God's wanting to do God's church and God's work to hinder God's work and God's church can bring God's discipline on your life look at verse number 32 
But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. What's God do? God chastens us. If you're a child of God, you know of the chastening of God in your life. God said, nope, nope. And you say, oh, yeah, I think it's okay. And he keeps pushing back and pushing back. And he will push you to the place that you will say, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. And you'll know that you need to get that right. And you need to take a different course than what you're taking. That's your experience in life. My experience as a child of God. That's what God does. Why? Because we're not going to be condemned with the world. God's going to see to it. Even if he has to take me out of this world to get me straightened out. Look at verse number 31. Uh, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God gives us the responsibility. Judge yourself so God doesn't have to judge you. You say, well, Jesus took all the judgment at the cross. Yeah, but this isn't what that's talking about. This is not what that's... It, it, you're not to, Jesus paid it all. We understand. We're not going to be punished. We're free in Christ Jesus. But having said that, God still will punish His children. Right? Yeah. Certainly will. So, verse 33 and 34. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Simply put, just consider others. He said, consider others. God means business at church. The problem of division. Why is there division? Schism? Because of heresies? Because of wrong thinking? About things? Sometimes it's doctrinal. Sometimes it's practical. Oh, yeah. I'm better than Aaron. I deserve to get the best cut on the table. I'm getting the flame filet mignon, and he gets the bologna. And you know what happens? I tell you what happens. He gets the blessing. And I get the blistering. That's what it says. There's no big eyes and little U's in God's family. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners saved by the good grace of God. Saints now, but only by God's great mercy. The problem of division, the positive of division, the prevention of desecration. Examine ourselves so we don't have to wind up experiencing the discipline of God in our lives. Let's stand. Pray about it.
Amen. Anytime you want to talk, pray. Let me know. Anybody. Kenny dismisses.